بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessings of the Messenger be upon the Messenger Muhammad, his family and his companions. Community servants. I'm going to tackle this topic in two parts, inshallah ta'ala. The first part being our obligation to the larger and broader community in which we live. The second part being the obligation and necessity of treatment that we have to our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters, our own community. Because both are equally important and without one, we can't have the other and without the way we look at how we treat each other, which is the second part, our overall da'wah will also fail, which goes hand in hand with what our dear Sheikh Arslan talked about, the the nafs, how we treat our own hearts is as important as how we also treat one another. It's very important, which I'll talk about in Shalom Ta'ala. When we look at how we treat the larger community that we live in here in, let's say, the Dallas area, or Texas, or the United States of America, or America in general. Servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes in many ways. And in one of those ways is service to his creation. Service to his creation. The Prophet sallallahu said that work is ibadah. Work is worship. Sincere work and sincere effort is worship. And here living as a minority in a country, that does not understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that does not understand what's going on with the world around them, that doesn't understand the purpose of their own life, it should cause us concern. If we look at the world today, and it is on a very speedy fast track towards three Ds. Number one, we see the world that we live in today is steeped in depravity. Steeped in depravity. Nobody cares about right or wrong anymore. Nothing about honor or dignity or truth. It matters anymore. Steeped in depravity. The world we live in today is also steeped in debauchery. All kinds of evils and, and things that you can't say in the inside of a masjid going on around us today. All kinds of fahisha, all kinds of munkar, all of it is happening at such a rapid pace that not only is it happening, it's now being indoctrinated into our communities, into our children's, in their schools, on, on, at your job, and everywhere you look. You can't even go shopping without being indoctrinated to this debauchery that is, that is fast-tracked now here in our Western society. May Allah protect us. And number three, on a fast-track to degeneracy. Fast-track to degeneracy. And all of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you talk about depravity, debauchery, degeneracy, all of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has summed up all of this type of evil with one word in the Quran, dhulm, dhulm, darkness, oppression, debauchery, degeneracy, evil, all of these things are referred to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as darkness, as a dhulm. And this is what we see the world headed to head over heels, like they are fighting each other to get there. <laughs> this, is the, this is the craziest thing that, especially for those of us who took the pandemic time for what we should have when it was a time for us to actually take a pause and look at our lives, look at the world. I completely changed my whole life and what I was doing during the pandemic and things that I was focused on and things I decided to put my energy towards because I looked at the world around us and saw that darkness was beginning to spread like we had never seen in our lifetimes. And I'm not old, but I'm not young either. This gray hair is starting to give it away. But we are seeing this fast track. So if we are seeing a world being covered in darkness, what is the antithesis to darkness? What is the solution for darkness? I don't ask allegorical questions, or I don't ask questions that I don't expect answers to, by the way, in my talks. If you've come to any of them, you know this. If I ask a question, I would like an answer. What is the answer to darkness? Light. You cannot solve darkness by anything other than light. If I come into a room with you and it's completely dark, I cannot help you in that room whatsoever if I didn't bring no light. 
If I come into the room and shut the door behind me and it's completely dark and I'm like, yeah, Habibi, I'm here to help you. Did you bring some light? No. Guess what? Then we both lost. We're both in this dark room. You can only help darkness by light. And what is light? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost describes himself as light. That he is the light of the heavens and the earth. But in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us a very beautiful verse. A very beautiful verse in Surah Al-Hadid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He it is who has revealed his ayat to his slave. Allah talks about the Quran. That is he who has revealed his ayat to his slave. لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ so that you can so that you can explain or bring them, you can make a way for them. So that you can make a way from them from darkness into light. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that this book, this kitab that we have, this Quran that is still with us today, which is the, the very thing by with which Allah saved my life. People ask me, how did I come to Islam? And I used to tell this whole long hour and a half story. You know what I mean? I, when my younger days, I don't have time for that anymore. I say the Quran. Allah allowed the Quran to be placed in my hands. And that's what brought me to Islam. Because that is what brings people from darkness unto light. And Allah says it in Surah Al Hadid, we have revealed these ayat to you, to our slave, so that it can be a way for people from darkness unto light. And for someone who came to Islam, as someone who came to Islam later on in their life, I will tell you that this Quran is the light that comes into the darkness to find you. I was lost. I had no idea what I was doing with my life. All whatsoever. The Quran was placed in my hands. Light was put in my life. Light was placed in my life. So much so that the reason why I spent the last 17, 18 years of my life traveling the globe to help other people was because I did not want to see anyone else sit in the darkness. I did not want anyone else who was sitting in that darkness like I was to not have the ability to grab the light. So this is our responsibility that we have to the broader community is that we as Muslims hold the light of guidance. One thing that we have, there's a lot of faith communities out there, right? <clears throat> All over. And, and, and we have no problem working for the good of the betterment of society with any group or any faith organization. But when it comes to saving humanity from this bullet, that cannot happen just by feeding people. Yes, you can keep people alive, right? By giving people aid. And I work as the president of a nonprofit organization. I know how important it is to feed people who are starving, to clothe people who are naked. We're going to have winter appeal coming up in a few months where I'll be traveling to very cold refugee camps in Lebanon, in Turkey, and seeing families that are freezing to death to help them. So I know how important this is. It's important. But you can help a person stay alive for a thousand years. If you do not bring their soul from darkness unto light, the length of their life has no benefit to them. Has no benefit. They can live a million years. It does not matter. Allah promises that every soul is going to taste death. And when you die, it will only matter, as Shaykh Arslan was telling us a moment ago, the position of your heart. Because Allah says in the Quran that the only ones who will be saved on the day of judgment are those who bring to Allah a good heart, a sound heart. And the heart cannot be saved except but by guidance. Except but by guidance. And when we see a world, how many of you will agree, so I know I'm not on the wrong page here, that the world is becoming ever increasingly steeped in darkness? Raise your hand. <clears throat> the world is growing dark. It's growing bleak. Okay, so who holds the light? We know what the light is, right? The light is the Quran. And that Quran, the Prophet wasallam, during his farewell sermon, right? The, the, the most... One of the most sound narrations we have from the Prophet ﷺ. If we don't know he said anything else, we know for sure he said this one. He said, I leave behind two things for you. If you hold on to them, you will never go astray. He said, first is Kitab Allah, the book of Allah. And it is a rope extending from the heavens where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above. And the other end of it is in your hands. That is the Quran. There is no faith group on the planet Earth that can boast having evidences like we have. 
And I've said this on many da'wah lectures that I've done where we've done interfaith lectures, right? And I think I mentioned that during I was here for uh, Y Islam da'wah event uh, open house uh, a few months ago. I ask always, I say, how many people of you here believe in Moses, right? When you have Muslims and Jews or whatever, everybody raise their hand, including the Muslims, right? I say, how many of you believe Moses performed miracles? They all raised their hand, right? I said, how many of you witnessed with your own eyes any of the miracles performed by Moses? They can't raise their hand, right? It's, you believe in it by faith. Okay, good, no problem, there's nothing wrong with faith. Faith is part of every religion. I say the same thing about Jesus, right? How many believe in Jesus? Everybody raise their hand except the Jews. And I say, how many of you believe you perform miracles? We all raise our hands. How many of you witnessed? Nobody's witnessed them, right? And I say, how many of you believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? All the Muslims raise their hand. How many of you believe he performed the miracles? All the Muslims raise their hand. And then I say, how many of you have witnessed one of the miracles he performed in his lifetime? And the few Muslims who get it, They'll raise their hand and I'll pick up a Quran and I'll say, here is the miracle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said every prophet was sent with a miracle to provide proof of who he was. The miracle I was sent with was the Quran. So I say, this is why we say in the present tense, Muhammad the Rasulullah. He is the messenger of Allah for us. Because this book remains. How do I know he existed? This book is here. How do I know he was who he says he was? This book is here. When I went to the Imam and asked him that I want to accept Islam, I said, I want to be a Muslim. He said, okay, do you believe in one God? I said, I always have. But Paul, you know, kind of messed me up for a long period of my life. Paul's gotten screwed up. He said, but in order to be a Muslim, you have to also believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So let me give you a book about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I said, you don't need to give me anything about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, except answer me a question. He said, what is that? I said, is he the one who gave us this book? And I was holding the Quran he gave me. He said, yes. Then I said, he is who he says he is. I don't need anything else. If he gave us this book, he is who he says he is. So we as Muslims have an obligation to the larger, broader community that we live in to show them that guidance, to give them that guidance that Allah has given us and has blessed us with. Because if we take it for granted, Allah will take it for us, from us. The Prophet ﷺ prophesied that there will come a time where the Qur'an will not exist on this earth anymore. It will have been forgotten. Its pages will be gone. No one will recite from it. Do not, us let, do not let us be the community that starts that road, that starts down that road. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says most famously in one of the most beautiful chapters of the Quran, I love it in the way it starts. Allah says, Beautiful, powerful verse where Allah speaks about his book. Glory be unto his slave and to his servant. I mean, glory be to he who is revealed unto his slave. Glory, Allah praises himself. Glory be to he who is revealed unto his slave, the Furqan. A beautiful name for the Quran. The Furqan. What does Furqan mean? That which distinguishes, that which criterionizes, that which can tell you right from wrong, that which can tell you good from evil, that which can tell you yes from no, the answers to everything. And Allah refers to it as Al Furqan. It is the criterion. It is the only, the first and the last thing that you will need to decide how to live your lives. And but why did he reveal it? He praises it first by being a furqan. Then he says why he sent it. So that it can become to mankind a warning. So that it can become to mankind something which warns them. Warns them from what? Warns them from this road that they're headed down. Depravity, debauchery, degeneracy stops them because that's what it did for me. I was living a life of, of, of heedlessness, not knowing who my creator was. I had abandoned religion. I had given up on God almost. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Quran as an adhira, as a warning to stop. Realize your purpose. Realize your existence. As our Sheikh said before us, what is our existence? What is our purpose? To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are someone who truly believes in Allah, and you truly believe in the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you have read anything about his life, 
if you know that there are people who live around you, if you know there are people who work with you, if you know there are people who shop at your business, if you know there are people that you interact with every single day that wake up not knowing who Allah is, that should be enough, enough for you to want to try to do something to help them. Because if you don't have that concern, then you have abandoned the entirety of the sunnah of the Prophet the entirety of it. Because I know we love to follow the sunnah, right? This is, this is important. This is important to follow the way and the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because he was Qur'an. His character was the Qur'an. So we follow him ﷺ. But what does Allah say? He commands him to say, قُلْ هَذِيهِ سَبِيلِ Yeah? Allah commanded, if you want to know about the sunnah, you have to start with the Qur'an. And Allah says, قُلْ هَذِيهِ سَبِيلِ Say to them, this is my way. What was his way? I call to Allah upon basira, which means guidance, sure knowledge, revelation from Allah. Then he says, what? Me and those who follow me. And glory be to Allah, we are not from the mushrikeen. So this should be something that is of importance to us. It should be something that is important to us. After we work on our own souls, as our sheikh said before, it should be of great importance to us to share that with other people. To share that guidance with other people. Because this was the way of not only our Prophet وسلم, but of all of the Anbiya. When Allah speaks of all of the Anbiya in the Quran, when He speaks of Nuh, when He speaks of Musa, when He speaks of Isa, when He speaks of Dawood, He talks about their mission of what? Calling people to Tawheed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was it. They suffered so greatly for what? Calling for the Tawheed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why was Nuh turned on by His people? Calling for Tawheed. Why was Musa turned on and had war with Pharaoh and chased through the desert and had to go across the ocean? Calling to Allah. Why was Ibrahim السلام, thrown into the fire? Calling to Allah. Why was Isa السلام, attempted to be crucified by his own people? Calling to Allah. Why did the Prophet his own family turn on him? His own city turn on him? He had to seek refuge in another city as an immigrant and have wars fought against him for years and years. Why? Calling to Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before that, they were all known as amazing people. They were all known as amazing. But what distinguished them, what made, what was the furqan for them, was revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as our sheikh said before us, one of the earliest of revelations, after Allah commanded his prophet, اِقْرَى بِسْمِ رَبِكَ لَذِي خَلَقَى Right after it, in telling him to worship Allah, Ya ayyuhat mudathir, O you who is wrapped up, qum fa'andir, get up and go warn them. Now you know me, you need to go tell someone else. So this is our responsibility to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet And with that calling to Allah, because you see a lot of people involved in da'wah today, right? The da'wah scene is, is saturated, mashallah. It's not a bad thing, except we forget the pillars of da'wah. Just like everything in Islam. I love the fact about this religion, right? I am a systematic human being. That's just how I operate. And I love the fact that Islam is systematic. You don't have to figure anything out. There's nothing that you have to go and say, okay, let me go and try to work this out in my brain and figure out. No, Allah has laid it all out for us. Da'wah. Da'wah has to be done in a systematic manner. And the first and very first rule of da'wah, Allah has laid it out for us. He gave us a command to call into his way. But he said, you must do it with hikmah, with wisdom, with wisdom. Wisdom first and foremost is defined by that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. That is wisdom. He reveals wisdom. He gives wisdom and guidance. So the Qur'an is hikmah. But the scholars have also taught us that wisdom is to use knowledge that comes from Allah at the right place at the right time and with the right attitude. And what is the attitude that Allah has commanded in the Qur'an? Ihsan. That when you give da'wah, you give it with ihsan. Meaning that your heart is in the right place. You're doing it for the right reason. You're not doing it so that you become known. Those are the very first category of people that will be thrown into the hellfire. Will be the ulama who did it just to be known. 
Who cares if anyone knows you? It does not matter. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. If Allah knows you, subhanAllah. That's it. That's all it. That's all you need. Wisdom is what is necessitated in da'wah. I will give you a small example before I go on to my next point. Because analogies are very important. We know that because Allah uses them in His book. He uses analogies because it causes the intellect to reason with the natural order of the world that it lives in. I travel a lot on airplanes, right? I hate them, by the way. I, I hate airplanes. Um, 10 can, 30 to 6,000 feet in the sky. It's not, it's not my favorite place. <clears throat> but I'm on a plane for eight hours, right? If I fly from here to London, it's eight hours. For eight hours, there are 250 people stuck on a plane with me, right? Guess what? I could see that as a captive audience and get up and start going up and down the aisles, calling people to da'wah, calling people to tawheed. You either believe in Allah or you're going to burn in hell. I could do that, right? Guess what happens when I arrive in London? FBI, MI6, they're all waiting on me. They're going to give me some da'wah, all right? That's it. My da'wah career is over. It's done. I'm banned. I'm on the ban list. I'm probably going to have to take a boat to get back to the United States or they're going to give me a nice personal flight back home. Yes or no? Was that wise? You can't say I did anything wrong necessarily because I was giving da'wah. How could you say I was wrong? It was not wise. I violated the very first rule of da'wah. I made sure that that was my first and last da'wah trip. So we must do it with wisdom. The second thing that must be included in our da'wah. And when I say da'wah, I mean not just calling people to Allah, but I mean all the good that we do to the community. Da'wah encompasses all of it. All the servitude to humanity. All of that service to humanity. It must be done with rahmah, with mercy. It has to be with mercy in mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about His Messenger, وَمَا رَسَلْنَكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you, we did not send you except but to be a mercy unto all of creation. A mercy. So our lives, our da'wah, our work, our communities should all be a source of mercy for the larger community around us. We should be a source of mercy in both lives, in this life and in the next life. That should be our source. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded it. For His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, therefore it has been by default commanded to us. When I used to live in California for a short period of time, we used to go to Skid Row and, 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 and give out you know, meals to people on Skid Row. And one of the things that I worked with the da'wah group there and taught them is we weren't doing direct da'wah. We weren't going and like, you know, using because we did not want to, it to seem like our, our, um, our giving them food was bait to try to bring them because that's what a, there are some religions out there that do that. We just wanted to show that we're here to serve humanity. But I would tell the young men, when people thank you, if they do thank you, tell them, do not thank me. Thank the one who created both of us. Because sustenance is from him alone. This would trigger a lot of people to inquire about Islam. Don't thank me. Thank the one who created both of us because sustenance is from him alone. I, I didn't give you food. I only delivered to you because in reality, did I give him food? No, I handed it to him. I handed it to him. I didn't create any of the wheat or grain that made the bread or the burger or the meat or the cat. None of it. None of it. It all is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything. There is no power. There is no movement. There is nothing except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our da'wah, our service to humanity has to be with wisdom and mercy. We have to have mercy towards humanity. Why? Because that is the overwhelming attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He introduces Himself with in the Quran in 113 chapters. And there are only 114. And out of 113 of it, Allah introduces Himself as Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. For a reason. For a reason. <clears throat> because He took an oath with Himself, as our Prophet ﷺ said, before creating creation. He saw everything that would ever happen. He knew what humanity was going to be like. And He said, I will let my mercy overcome my anger. So our servitude to humanity, our ser excuse me, our service to humanity, needs to be in an attempt to reach servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be done with wisdom 
and with mercy in mind. Now, with my last 10 minutes, what about how we treat one another? The, the, the community servant towards each other. This is the one we're failing at the most. I'll tell you right now. This is the one we are failing at the most in our present time. The da'wah is being done, alhamdulillah. You see a lot of people going forward and doing good things. That's a beautiful thing. But the way we treat one another is our make or break as a community. And I will prove to you why in the next 10 minutes. It is make or break for us as an ummah. And we are failing at it miserably right now. The way we treat one another, I'm telling you right now, and I will make this statement boldly. I am very glad, alhamdulillah, I was introduced to Islam before I was introduced to Muslims. I am so grateful I was introduced to Islam before I was introduced to Muslims. Because were it for Muslims alone, I would have not stayed. Not stayed. I've been Muslim 26 going on 27 years. The way we treat one another is, is an abomination and an antithesis to the way the Prophet ﷺ taught us to be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to breeze through these. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, first and foremost, Inni hatihi ummatan This your ummah is one ummah. Don't get it twisted. There's no groups. There's no such thing as groups. This ummah, your ummah is one ummah. If you are a Muslim who believes in Allah with oneness, with Tawheed, you believe that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the last and final messenger of Allah. You believe the Quran is the true speech from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You follow the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, you are part of that ummah. And you are my Muslim brother. Or you are my Muslim sister. End of story. Khalas. That's where it ends. Anything beyond that is secondary. And we can agree to disagree on many points. But you are my brother or sister in faith. End of story. And I am to love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless of what we may agree or not agree on. And then Allah says, I am your Lord, therefore worship me. Your ummah is one ummah. Your ummah is one ummah. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah will be with his slave. When, when Allah says he will be with someone, do you understand what that means? Let me equate that for you. Our Prophet وسلم, when he was escaping Mecca and he was hiding with Abu Bakr, they were hiding. If How many of you have ever been to that cave where they were hiding? Raise your hand if you've been to that cave where they where were hiding. No? Yeah, you've been there. You can't hide in that cave. There's, no, there's nowhere to hide. Literally, there's nowhere to hide in that cave. And Abu Bakr said this. He said, oh, oh Messenger of Allah, if they, if they look at the ground, they're going to see us. What did he say? Oh, Abu Bakr. What do you think is going to be the, 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 the end result of two people whom the third of them is Allah? When Allah is with you, you cannot be defeated. You cannot be defeated. So the Prophet ﷺ said Allah will be with his slave as long as he is helping and with his brother. That if you are with your brother and you stand behind your brother's back and you have your brother's back and you have your sister's back, and you love them for the sake of Allah, Allah is with you. Allah is with you. The Prophet ﷺ said that the believers are like a building. We are building this beautiful, we're talking about legacy, right? Legacy. We are building a building that will be the legacy of this generation. What it's going to look like for our children and our grandchildren. That building is being built by us brick by brick. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the believers are like a building. Each brick is put in a place strategically to support one another for the overall structure of the building. He said they are like that. And then he interlaced his fingers. He went like this when he said that. That you are like this. You're interlaced. You're co-joined. You can't separate. If you do, you create the weakness of the structure. This is why we find ourselves in a, in a state of dhulla throughout the world, humiliation. Because we have interlaced ourselves. We have disjointed ourselves, disunited ourselves. We're weak. One of the seven categories of people on the day of judgment who will have the shade of the throne of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this shade is like no other shade. It's not like the shade of this world. He said, one of those categories or people or one person who meets his brother and departs only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that you meet your brother or your sister only for the sake of Allah. You do it for the sake of Allah. 
The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that there was once a man who was going to visit his brother and an angel was sent to him to ask him, why are you going in the shape of a man? Why are you going to visit your brother? Do you owe, does he owe you money? Because usually that's what we're after, right? Knock on the door, you got some money? No, I don't need any money from him. Does he, does he owe you a favor? Is there some service you need for him? He said, no, 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 I'm just going to visit him because I love him for the sake of Allah. He said, know that the one whom you love, your brother for his sake, loves you in return. Love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply for loving your brother or your sister. So simple. It seems so simple, but we make it very complicated. Also, Imam Ahmad reported a hadith al-Qudsi from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Allah said, my love is due. My love is due to those who love each other for my sake. I have obligated myself to love those whom love one another for my sake. My love is due to those who visit one another for my sake. My love is due to those who help one another for my sake. My love is due to those whose hearts hold no grudge ill feelings and do not disconnect and break ties with one another. The Prophet Sallallahu also said, and you'll find this by Abu Huraira in Sahih Muslim. This one is, I couldn't make it any more important than this. He said, you will not enter paradise until you believe. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu said, you will not enter paradise until you believe. And then he said, you will not believe until you love one another. Our Prophet وسلم, tied our love to one another to paradise. That you will not enter paradise until you believe. And you will not truly believe until you love one another. And he then, he went so far to explain it and said, can I show you that which, which if you do it, it will cause you to love one another. And they said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said, spread salam. Spread the salam. What does that mean? That means when I greet my brother and I say, As-salamu alaykum. Or I meet, you meet your sister and you say, As-salamu alaykum. You mean that. It's not just phraseology. You mean it. As-salamu alaykum. I wish peace be upon you. And if there is any way I can help you in that endeavor and bring more peace to your life, please let me know. Please let me know. We have a lot of Muslim brothers and sisters who say, Salaamu Alaikum to each other, and they mean the exact opposite. Like the Jews who used to greet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Assalamu Alaikum, they used to say, Death be on you. But yet we cover it in guise of Assalamu Alaikum. You don't mean it. You don't mean it. If you want to go to paradise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Love one another. Love one another for his sake. I'll give you a couple more and there will be none, inshaAllah. Another hadith of Qudsi recorded by Imam Tirmidhi, Allah Ta'ala He says, Allah Ta'ala says, those who love each other for my glory, they don't do it for any worldly reason. If I say, brother, I love you, I love you for the glory of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, to praise and glorify Him alone. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, I will grant them pulpits of light on the day of judgment. I will place them on thrones of light. And they will be the envy. Listen to this. They will be the envy of the NBA wa shuhada. The NBA and the shuhada will look at them and say, MashaAllah, they've granted an amazing, an amazing station being given these pulpits of light. Even though the shuhada have been given an honor like none of us will have. The prophets have been given an honor like none of us will have. But Allah is going to give such a beautiful station to people who love one another simply for His sake on the Day of Judgment that they will become envious of them. How easy is it to earn this reward? How easy to simply love your brother or sister for the sake of Allah? I'll give you a couple more and then I, as I wrap it up, inshaAllah. The Prophet wasallam, two things as I close. He said, I asked Allah for three things for my ummah. Three things. Two of them he granted me. The third of them he refused me. He said, I asked Allah about my ummah. Do not allow my ummah to be destroyed by famine. Meaning don't wipe off the whole ummah off the face of the earth by starving it into death. He said, Allah said, I will not do that. He said, I asked Allah not to allow my ummah to be destroyed by being overcome by its enemies. And they wiped them off the globe. He said, Allah granted me that. 
He said, then I asked Allah, this is also the wisdom of the Prophet knowing what to ask. He said, I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not allow my ummah to be destroyed by fighting amongst each other. And he said, Allah didn't give it to me. We are our own worst enemy. We're our destruction. We're destruction. The Prophet wasallam once took an example of one stick and he broke it and snapped it. And he said, this is the Muslim who goes out on their own. Break them off easy. Shaitan has a field day with you. But then he put a bunch of them together and he didn't. He said, this is the jama'ah. This is the jama'ah. This is the body of Muslims. Stick with them. And I'll leave you with one final warning. <clears throat> As Zubayr ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu radah, he said that the Prophet wasallam said, there has come to you a disease that came to the nations that were before you. There has come to you, and he saw it, he saw it creeping up in his ummah. He said, there has come to you a disease like the disease of the nations who came before you. What is it? Envy. Hasad. Hasad for one another. Envy for one another. And hatred. And he said it is like a razor. It's like a razor. Except this razor doesn't shave the hair. He said, this is like a razor that shaves the faith. The iman. It shaves off your iman. And he said, then he swore and he said, by the one is, whose hole is my hand, his hand is my soul. Whenever the prophet used to want to make something very serious, he would always say, by the one in whose hands is the soul of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You do not believe until you love one another. You do not believe until you love one another. And you will not enter paradise until you believe. And you know the very famous hadith of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said, do you love paradise? He asked the companions, do you love paradise? So I'm going to ask you that, brothers and sisters. Do you love Jannah? Yes. He said, then love for your brother what you love for yourself. If you love paradise so much, then love for your fellow Muslim brother or sister what you love for yourself. We are a reflection of one another. The way we treat one another is the way we are going to be treated by the larger world around us. And if we have not put that connection together, as someone who spent a lot of time, I started looking at the rise and fall of the Islamic civilizations. The way in which we treat one another is the way in which Allah causes the world around us to treat us. So if we wonder why the world hates us, look at the way we treat one another. If you wonder why the world doesn't respect us, look at the respect we have for one another. If you wonder why the world wants to find every fault they can in us, look at the way we love to find fault in one another. Everything that we do to each other is what Allah is causing the world to do to us, to show us and warn us. But we are ghafl or heedless, we're just out there. So we must work on the way we treat one another, and then we must work on the way we treat the larger world around us. Because that on the day of judgment, the only thing that is going to matter is how we believed and what we did. That's it. Not how you were known, not what legacy, not, none of that. What matters is what you believe and what you did. That's the only thing that will matter. So do better. We can do better, inshallah. Jazakallahu khairan, barakallahu feekum jami'ah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.